Um, my name is Lata Sitake, which I forgot to put on here, my bad. But um, uh, I am wanting to investigate support systems and educational success, and that's a little bit of what I'm going to talk to you guys about today. Um, the issue is education among Native American populations. Uh, historically, Native Americans learn by doing and working alongside of their parents or their mothers or whoever it was that would, would be teaching them. That's how Native Americans learn historically, and even Tongans, because I'm half Tongan too, but that's how we learn. We had to adapt into the Western, well, the new culture of learning, where you sit and then people talk to you, and you have to take that in and, and learn from it, and uh, that's, that's one of the struggles I, I feel is a, a problem with, with some of the education that we're struggles that we're dealing with now. Um, I really liked this quote where it says, if kids come to us from strong, healthy, functioning families, it makes our job easier. If they do not come to us from strong, healthy, functioning families, it makes our job more important. Um, I kind of believe that philosophy, coming from a teacher's point of perspective, but I'm, I want to look at it from a family or a support system perspective. Uh, a lot of the issues that we've been talking about, or that I've been hearing everybody talk about, stem from lack of education. Everybody's saying, well, we need to educate people, we need to educate people, we need to educate people. Well, how do you educate people if there's a root problem? And so what I want to do is find out what the root problem is. Um, dropout rates, so I'm going to start with high schoolers. Dropout rate for Native Americans is ridiculous. Three out of ten natives will drop out prior to graduating high school. Uh, I, I'm not familiar with the statistics on Salt River, and I was trying to get them before, but I kept missing the principle. But the dropout rates on Salt River here are ridiculous. Last year was the biggest graduating class they had of all years at the high school, and they had between 20 and 25 kids graduate. I'll go. A lot. <laughs> they have a couple hundred, but then the, the ratios fluctuate. Because then some of them also transfer over and get GEDs, or they try to get GEDs at, at an extension, like an accelerated learning program. Uh, it's ridiculous. I, I've already seen so many of my own children that I work, because I, I also coach basketball and volleyball on the res, and then I teach preschool. So I jump all over. But some of my own kids just dropped out, and nothing I can do about it. Uh, it, it is also, it's also twice the national average for dropout rates. So, I mean, that's saying something. Something. Um, I want to talk a little bit about support, support systems. Uh, this is the in the study that I read the white Anglo <laughs> definition for support systems for the sake of that study. Uh, primary social group involving social or generational alliances, permanence, concern for the total person, heightened emotionality, caring for one another, mutual goals, an altruistic orientation to members, and a governance approach that is nurturing. Mm. Nothing too phenomenal. <laughs> and this is the definition of a Native American uh, family support systems. Close-knit, predominant behavioral pattern of balance within the spiritual, emotional, physical, and social dimensions, capable of adjusting. Adult members are resourceful and engaged in personal growth, stable, committed, presence of adults to socialize with children. I thought that that was one of the interesting differences, is the presence of an adult to socialize with children. Um, that is very big in Native American culture. That natives love their families. And... Um, Sadly, a lot of the families are deteriorating. There are so many problems on the reservation that are just breaking the families apart that those support systems are just not there. And without a happy, healthy foundation, how can you have a successful future? I'm not saying that all kids are like that because some, there are some children that are resilient, but all in all, it makes for a rough, rough life and a rough future. Um, in the same study, they also describe that health beliefs, values, and cultural practices are said to be learned values within the family unit. So, children in Native American cultures learn their values and health practices and beliefs and 
and become who they are within the family, or should be within the family. Um, I feel like that's transitioning now. It's not exactly being learned in the family. They're finding other places to find and, and establish those kinds of values and beliefs, and that's what's disconcerting. Um, the destruction of Native family. So we're going to get to the needy greedy. <laughs> <laughs> um, assimilation. Assimilation is a process of losing one culture and taking on another. Um, these are just talking to, uh, talking about ethnocentric um, cultures and beliefs. Um, I think that those are the things that stemmed the boarding schools and genocide. Uh, it kind of just talks a little bit about it. Uh, I'm not going to read it verbatim, but the just the dangers of ethnocentricity. I'm going to show us a little clip, which I really, really like. federal government. They took it off. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm, I'm are you serious? <laughs> They're like, no. <laughs> Too much truth there. <laughs> oh, I forgot to let you read this. It might be uh, Rio Tinto. <laughs> they might have heard about yesterday. <laughs> I'll see if I can catch this up. The... The idea behind the boarding schools is they come in, they take the kids, take them from their homes, take them from their families, their parents, their siblings, ship them out, and then teach them how to be civilized. Civilized. Mm -hmm. well, that should be right. We'd be wondering how come they're like that. We were dressed like that, but these little kids were. I remember being younger, growing up on a reservation, and being told, don't trust white people, don't listen to them. Why? The government schools are constantly being built and hospitals added. We bring them in, clean them up, and start them on their way to civilization. I would ask social services and human services audience, how many people know about residential boarding schools? How many people here do? This never makes it into the history books. This is never taught. Why did those schools get started? And who started them? And what was the rationale behind it? And the first general policy was the only good Indian was a dead Indian, that we needed to be killed, exterminated, eradicated. Um, once they realized that's a little bit more difficult to do is to have mass genocide of a population, the policies changed to, from killing to killing the Indian and saving the man. There's a general Pratt who was well famous and documented for using those words to kill the Indian and save the man and that we are subhuman. 
that our ways are savage and we need to be civilized. Well, and the governments in Canada and the United States followed that policy up until the, the 1980s in one form or another. There is a boarding school far, far away where we get mush and milk for three times a day. Oh, how the huskies run when they hear their dinner bell. Oh, how the huskies run three times a day. Like I say, I went to the mush hall when I was four years old. I was there for nine years. And uh, once in a while we'd come home on then, summertime, but not all the time. When the consuls came and told my dad that he couldn't raise us properly, we were at the mush hall one week and our heads were full of bugs. Well, there were a lot of sad times, but I mean, like, I didn't get, like, angry and have any resentment until after I got out. But I didn't know, like, uh, from just from five and a half to 16, they would just thought it was just like a normal upbringing. Like, they not had no parents and stuff like that. <laughs> so that's, uh, and after I got out, and then they thought, well, this is the way they were supposed to be, uh, treating us. I think my mother couldn't take care of us because uh, our father was uh, into alcohol. Me and my sister, we started there in 1945. I was five years old at the time. We had all our hair cut off. We were made baldies. We were really bald. And uh, that wasn't a very good feeling to have. And uh, they used to call us uh, mushroom baldies. That's what they used to, the kids on every day used to call us. Well, we can go in now. I mean, this is going to take like all day, eh? <laughs> I need a few minutes. We were taken to the hospital to get checked out for uh, nits and whatever, I guess that was, you know. And, well, they checked us out, you know. Then, you know, then, then they split us. The, the school was split in the age group and by the boys and girls, boys were on one side, the girls were on one side. And they went from the lower age up to the uh, high school level. My mom was going to walk out here and go to the store. And, uh, and at five and a half, I, uh, my sister tells me that I grabbed my mom's leg. And, uh, you know, of course, we were all just crying. Or the whole four of us were just crying. Like, you because know, uh, my mom was going to leave us here. So I got at my mom's leg and uh, I'm up crying and that and uh, just kind of like uh, hollering like, Ma, don't leave me, don't leave me like that. Uh, so, but anyway, like uh, while that was going on, like, the supervisor came over and just kind of grabbed me and took me off my mom's leg and, uh, and then my mom just walked out and I've never seen her. For those ten, 10 years I don't share. She never come to see me once. I don't know why. He took my brother away to where he was supposed to. I just kind of wanted to give a, a little bit of an idea. I'm going to have us watch all of it. So the children were taken. The parents were actually bringing them. Some were taken and then some were given the support. option. Mm -hmm. um, the government, it, they were tricky people. They could get you to do what they wanted and uh, and at that time it was take your kids to a boarding school and also at that time is when the reservation started so they weren't allowed to leave the reservation you would be killed if you left the reservation so yeah. so these children are off the reservation mm -hmm. at a boarding school the parents are stuck on the reservation where they can't leave so they never saw the parents after this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yes. they, they were taken away and then after they were released from boarding school they could go back and try to find their parents and that's what my coochie did. This is my this is my family. This is my coochie right here. This is my, my grandpa or my great grandpa, um, my great grandma, and then my grand my other coochie is just my coochie sister right there. And then this is my mommy. So you can see my mom. <laughs> the cute little glasses. <laughs> Um, and these are my aunties and my uncles. Um, my grandma, she grew up in the boarding school. She 
was taken from her family very young, and she has she had really really messed up feet. Her feet were really messed up because they only got one pair of shoes every year, and that was the pair they got. So if their feet grew, you had to smash them in the shoe, and you still had to wear it. So her she had really bad toes, and she, I used to have to, to help file them down, and her feet got messed up, and she used to tell me how because they sep they got separated, the older kids would bully them even among themselves, they would bully them and steal their food and eat their food up at, at lunch or dinner or whatever time. So she said that they used to be so hungry that they would sneak out and go find squirrels and kill squirrels and eat them. If they couldn't find a squirrel or kill anything, they would just drink water because their stomachs hurt so bad because they were so hungry. Um, they weren't allowed to speak their language at all. If they were to speak Sioux, they would be, they would be beaten and punished severely. And so Growing up, she also didn't teach my mom. When, when she came home and was released from the boarding schools, she didn't know how to have a family. It destroyed the memories of families. She does not she did not know how to she did not know how to love my mom. She she cared about my mom so she would, you know, be vigilant, but she didn't know how to express love. She didn't know how to express certain things. She didn't know what a family unit was. And a lot of these kids didn't know what a family unit was. This single act just demolished, demolished family values in Native culture. And so now we're saying, oh, here, be educated. But, okay, we just rocked your family system, so now you're trying to recover. We're just in the recovery mode right now. We're still trying to, to get over that. I mean, I'm, I'm really thankful because my... I, I'm, I'm in that recovery generation, you know. My mom, she, she did better than my, my grandma did. My mom did go to college. She, she did get a higher education, which kind of is another study that I'm going to want to investigate because my mom went on a, something called an Indian placement program for um, the Mormon church. <laughs> and so she went with that, and sh there's been horror stories about that too, but she, she had actually a positive story with it, and it, it changed her life. And it changed my life in, a re in return because she learned how to to be involved in a loving family. But I'm going to investigate that too sometime. <laughs> but not right now. <laughs> Let me just say, th th this is uh, the kind of thing I think about when uh, that sovereign nation talks about an accredited university. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, are you kidding me? Yeah. Well, that's the We're mentality. Sure it's like, this is the right to. way. <laughs> you know what I mean? And this was their way of civilizing us. This yeah. act is not civilized at all. I know. Sure. I know. So that the, um, <laughs> some of our students uh, have the opportunity to get funded from their, na their native tribes. Um, and some tribes won't fund Native American students because this new university isn't accredited. Mm -hmm. So here you have Native American students who want to get an education. We're going forward, like you all here, trying to get an education, trying to improve yourselves, of course, but you're not doing this for yourselves. No. You know, no. you're doing it for your community. Yes. And then oh. to have the native tribe say, "Oh, we're not gonna, we're not gonna support the school because they're not accredited," which is a, a, a policy of the U.S. government, the same policy they had here. Mm -hmm. It's like they're still under that acclamation. They're yeah. still under that paternalism. Yes. Uh, and it's just uh, shameful. Shameful. It's just hard. Because yeah. we I'm still have my trust. <laughs> <laughs> that trust responsibility, we still yeah. think it's yeah. there. It? Yeah, and the audacity to use the word trust. Yeah. yeah. But, it, but it's, it's, it's the same in North Korea. It's fine. But, yeah, it's so the same. It's, it's <laughs> right. Same, same right. in the Soviet Union under Stalin. Right. So it's it's nothing to be surprised at. Under Stalin, who was a yeah. a priest. Yeah, that's right. right? Just like the So this is the uh, seminary. Yeah. For here. So this is a sort of a yeah. But the by the way, for our visitors, um, the Heard Museum in Phoenix, which is a, a wonderful museum, still has the boarding school exhibit going. Really. And it's been going for a while, and so you've seen the Heard Museum? No. If you have time tomorrow, morning it's, I don't know what time they open, but uh, I've taken a lot of people there. You've been? Yeah, I've seen the exhibit. Yeah. 
And it's sort of, and the only escape from it is the cemetery at the schools. This was another way to get back. Was the cemetery? Oh God! Yeah, and it says there was a closing of the exhibit. The only escape was the cemetery. It, it just rocked the whole culture. It's just, it's just sad. I don't like to think about it too much because it makes me get teary eyed. <laughs> um, so these are some of the effects that ha occurred from boarding schools. There's, there's many more that uh, could fall onto the list. Uh, family structures destroyed, like we, we were discussing. Alcoholism, because they don't know how to cope. I mean, you're, you're sent into this situation and you don't have parents to teach you and and if pre and if historically you learned by working alongside someone and had that kind of interaction and then to be ripped away from it and then just thrown into this new environment without any instruction where are you going to turn well of course i'm going to look in the bottom of a bottle or drugs <laughs> or, or something to try to escape um the loss of identity they cut their hair they give them new names. Even now, I, sometimes I try to do family genealogy work and I cannot find some of my relatives because I have to figure out what their native names were, what their, what their English name, which one they were using. It's a big mess. Um, they took away the family memories. Um, they increased the vul vulnerability of the children because they were taken at such young ages. I mean, that, that fellow was taken at the age of five. I mean, that is young to be taken away from your family and then put into that kind of environment. Um, and then it just... So this was like what year? What year are we talking about? Oh, goodness. It, it was a long span of time. Let me see if I can remember if I can. I'll, I'll, look, I'll look it up for the, the years. It, it, was over, it was over a long span of time, not just a short moment. Because, I mean, some of these people were spending decades yeah. within, within the system. I'm thinking like 1920s. 18, 1870, I think, isn't it? Well, I know my grandma was at the end. Seven, ge seven, the seven generations. Seven generations. Seven generations. That's a lot. Because when it ended. So, I mean, and then people are like, well, get over it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've had people tell me, get over it. And I'm like, don't, don't talk to me right now. I'm going to go to my happy place. <laughs> because you can't get over something while the problems are still ongoing. Yeah. Exactly. You can get over it once it's resolved yeah. and it's dealt with. But well, and they don't even teach it. They yeah, don't, they don't the... teach it in the school. I mean, there's like zero, zero responsibility taken for that. They just ignore it. They sweep it under the rug. Oh, What, what does the teachers say when you bring this up to them? Why aren't you talking about this? What are they... What do they say? They don't know. They don't know. They yeah. don't know. They don't. That you don't know. You don't know. They don't know. They don't know. <laughs> they don't know. Well, some of my teachers, they didn't even know that I was Native American because I look mostly Polynesian. So a lot of the times I, I would say, well, that's not how it is. Because they would <laughs> give me information like, that is not how it is. And they would say, well, how do you know? I'm like, I'm part, I'm Native American. I'm registered in this tribe. And they're like, what? But you're not a drunk. And I'm all, oh my gosh, you did not just say that to my face. <laughs> <laughs> But it's true. Wow. Like there's such a, a stereotype that's been perpetuated through generations of time. Oh, natives are drunks. Natives are drunks. That's all they are. Or they they just go, oh they're just quiet crying, licking their wounds. But we they, we haven't been given the opportunity to to mourn because you have to have the time to mourn. But you cannot mourn if you're being ignored. If everybody's if taking it as a secret. Yeah. yeah. If they're not bringing it to light, you cannot expect a nation to of people that was once thriving and strong to be strong again, just fall down and pick it back up after seven generations of this, and then not even that, like hundreds of years of genocide and extermination acts and re relocations. And, and ongoing assault. Yeah, and, 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 and it's still going. And it's still going. Boarding and, they to, in and they wanted me to take the video off. Yeah, it yeah. started in 1920. Yeah. <laughs> and it happened even in 1940. Harvard was a Indian school. Oh, Harvard? Harvard. I did not know that one. Well, that's fun. Okay. So, or had an Indian school. Had an Indian school. So, now I'm going to transition a little bit from into the effects of that boarding school, how it, how it, excuse me, how it just laid a foundation, well, crumble the foundation of family um, to modern day time. If I can get it to work. Yeah, those are funny pictures. Yeah, these are their, <laughs> these are their families. Yeah. It's like, who's what? <laughs> yeah, mixed. The, mixed. 
I'm not going to play through all of it, but just just the background. There's this this little boy. His name is um, Robert Looks Spice, and uh, he's got these beautiful aspirations of becoming the first Native American uh, president. So this is a current. Video. This is a current video. Okay, he lives in a trailer home with about eight other kids and other people, and it's like very small. On the world he sees. On the dry, windswept hills and plains, <coughs> two million acres, there is not a single mall, nor a movie theater, a big business, a bank, a big house. All around him, old public housing, broken by the decades. 70% of his high school friends will drop out of school. 70 to 80% of the adults are unemployed. And the people who once mastered the mountains, the wildness, and the blizzard are now being crushed by something else. There's an estimate that 80% of the adults on the reservation are alcoholic. And there's a kind of contagious epidemic of suicide. Back at the trailer, Robert's grandmother, Blossom, who was taken in the casualties of parental addiction and neglect. I raised not only my grandkids, but I raised some of my cousin's kids. Things happen around this life. This is what happened to my husband. Cousin DJ says the scars on his hands happen when his mom was high. Oh, bro. She did cocaine. She spilled hot water. And what about Robert? He came here because his mother struggles with alcohol too. What's the first thing you notice if she's been drinking? Um, the way her eyes are oh. and the way she's um walking. Cause like, sure. when she drinks, she gets out of control and she says things. I lay in my bed, worried about her crying. We wanted to know more about the mother of this extraordinary boy. We met up with her two hours away in Rapid City, where she works at a bar and does gardening. She had been drinking. I would do anything for my son. She's also been drinking when she comes for a surprise visit with Robert, and we're there. And as the day goes on, her son buckles for sadness. Oh, my morning you says nothing. I don't like it. She calls me a bunch of names. She says she's not my, I'm not her son no more and all that stuff. She says she don't want to be by me no more. On an ancient hillside, near the graveyard of his family, a boy who is broken as the sun rises undefeated. At the dances, Robert wears the highest honor given by the tribal elders, equal feather, because they reach toward the sky. The competition, he wins prize money, which he shares with the grandmother who gave him a home. I feel like I'm just happy to be with the family that loves me right now. And when he gets to the White House, he promises he'll make sure his grandmother Blossom has one of her favorite foods, dough cooked in oil. They call it Indian fry bread. <laughs> and Grandma said she wants a whole floor to herself, smelling like fry bread. <laughs> He's adorable. He is. And she wants a teepee and a main part. A child of warriors in a tiny room, fighting with what he has, knowing other kids wake up to so much more. You never get a little jealous of how easy they have life? No, because. My uncle told me there's going to be a muddy road and an easy road. The rich kid takes the easy road and the poor kid takes the muddy, rough road. And they're building up strength the whole time. Like, you're becoming a warrior. But you are a warrior now. So that the the background of, of Robert is not a, is not a stranger to any of the other kids that 
we work or what we work with here in the community and any reservation at that um, alcoholism is just rampant through through and through the destruction of families falling at every every drop of bottle and uh, this kid, he's a resi one of the, one of the resilient ones, but I mean, even even with his type of resilience, you saw how that affected him, how how seeing his mother um, intoxicated coming to visit him and reacting to him like that still affected him. And, I mean, he's going to school and he's thinking about that, and I know that because I've had a lot of my own kids when I'd be coaching them, they they come to me and they'd be like Lata. And they'd be crying, and they'd be like, "Lots of this happened in my house tonight, or this happened in." <laughs> and of course, I'd have to tell the administration because I'm, you're mandated. Mm -hmm. So I would tell the proper authorities. But I mean, it breaks my heart because these kids—they are—they have bright futures. They have a lot of potential, but they just cannot unlock it because they are stuck in an ugly, ugly battle an ugly upward climb that they're trying to get out of. But and it's and it's even harder too because as native people you think that we would be cheering on one another like, yes, do it, let's do it, climb, climb, climb. No. We also we also add to our own problem. We pull each other down. We see somebody go climbing and almost getting out of that bucket, we'll reach up and try to pull them back down. It's just sadly some some people some of them are, are like that and some of us are like that. So it's like a double battle. You're fighting the people from the top, and you're fighting the people from the bottom. And all the while, you're trying to climb out of that bucket. Um, sorry, we're getting some of the destruction. Like, like, like I said at the beginning, if health beliefs, values, and cultures or practices are to be learned within the family unit, what's being taught in those homes where there is no family unit? You know, where the kid just sees alcohol and drugs and now they have this new thing where they use uh, those CO2 cartridges now, what do you call those? What do you call whip it? It. Whip whip it. It. thank you what do you call them that? that's been going on for a long time it's not oh. now <laughs> well they're everywhere now I mean you can it was perk actually you probably go drive on the res and there's probably like mountains of them on the sides of the road just everywhere and they're driving around doing the whippets. They're, as a matter of fact, earlier this year, a couple of young teenage kids, well, 18, um, died. Hi. Because they ran a stop sign and got thrown from the car while doing whippets. This is CO2 or CO2? CO2, yeah, CO2. Those little, like, air gun. Or used to make, like, to turn um, cream into whipped cream. Yeah, that too. Oh, let's see. Or what, uh, to, for BB guns? Yeah. Those are CO2 cartridges too. Yeah. But they're resourceful, <laughs> but um, and then what? What I want to investigate is how can we solve that? How can we solve the, the dropout the dropout rates? How do you fix that? How can we fix that? And uh, one of the one of the what are they dropping out to do? Nothing, just to it's drink not and party and and and. Sleep all day and do nothing. I mean, to like give up attitude. Yeah, give up. I'm just gonna party and have fun. I try. I'm just gonna do whatever, ever, whatever I've always seen. Mm -hmm. And it's been a battle too. It's been a battle for. Uh, well, I'm sure you know. It's been a battle for myself with my own with my own kids that, that I coach, where I'm like, no, no. There is so much more. There is life off off of the reservation that you can investigate and then come back. And I always tell my kids, Molly, you can always come home. Mm -hmm. You can always come home. But take every opportunity to be able to learn and grow and then come back and help your, and help your community. And I've only had one, maybe two do it. You know, they're brave enough. And then one came back, unfortunately, so far. But what I'm hoping is that if we strengthen the support systems at home, that that might help a little bit buffer some of the problems and challenges that are being faced um, in Native American high school by high school students. Um, I don't know, what are some other steps that you guys think? In the regular public schools, you know, so it is not only common among the Native Americans, so in Milwaukee among the African American population, mm -hmm. this is a similar scenario. 
So what they do is um, alternative high school. Do you guys have that? Yeah. Okay. So in alternative high school, um, there are also so much research out there that um, in North Dakota or somewhere, they start the day with one hour yoga. So that these kids, when they come to school, as you said, you know, they are thinking about still their mom and dad in prison or drug, you know, alcohol and those things. So when they come, the first one hour, they just, you know, breathe in and read out so that they are completely out of those thoughts. And then they start the day. And then in between little breaks, you know, so it, they need not take higher level AP classes as long as they take for food, means how to cook Native American food. You know, that's the yeah. food class, you know, something meaningful for them. And then if they need to work in a job, you know, so what kind of skills they need, you know. So like um, in the alternative school where in MP, you know, Milwaukee Public Schools, they have gardening, you know, they have food. And they have, so those required classes, you know, some basic math, the maximum they go is algebra, you know. So they just do the basic math for them to be successful, you know. Um, so four years of simple math and uh, so basic science like food and, you know, forensics and something like that. Um, then they graduate. Okay. So that's the alternative curriculum, you know. So even for social studies, I know they have, instead of a vigorous uh, uh, U.S. history course or something, you know, in easy English, American history in easy English, you know, so kind of very simple books, you know, which anybody can read and discuss and understand, you know, so each chapter is just one page long, and then they discuss, you know. Just get them to yeah. feel good about themselves Correct. first. Yeah. Then they can grow so more. On so they get credit education. for doing that same social studies credit they get mm -hmm. because it's still mm -hmm. American history. Yeah, right? I know that at the tribal school here that they are trying to make strides to help the kids feel more empowered by knowing who they are and, and their uh, they, they can do um, a project citizen project like that for social studies credit. Yeah. Are the you kids know, enjoying those project. programs, by the way? Their Native American broad, um, studies? Or are they feeling pushed and they want to be in the other world? That that is actually the battle that they're that they're dealing with right now in that in the high school here is that the high school is saying well so we're it's not another we're, burden and a pressure rather than yeah, a pleasure exactly they're saying well the kids are, they're they're not rising to the level that they should be at because we're dumbing everything down for them so why are we why are we giving them setting them uh, setting lower expectations rather than setting the normal expectations and expecting them to rise and it's they're kind of just bobbling back and forth between that. I mean, they had given homework at this school for a couple, a couple of years. They just started giving homework this year. This year is the first year since forever that they started giving out homework to the students to take home and do, and they try to bring back. Um, they even try to lower the sports program so then that way they would be sanctioned by the AIA so that they can still participate and not have to pay huge fees to be able to, to have to cancel a game if they don't have enough if they don't have enough eligible players. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's pretty bad. So everyone will go to regular school. Only if you see a student who is withdrawing, so you know, the teachers, counselors will go and talk to those children and then they will be put in uh, you know, they will be those programs. Yeah, in fact the alternative school is also in the same campus. Nobody would know. Oh. So instead of going to this science class, this child would go to this science class. Our you know? ELA class here is overbooked. There's actually a waiting list to be able to get into the program, so that way you can try to even work towards. But I, I worked on that campus, and I helped to teach them classes. And it's yeah. it's poor. The, the 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 teaching is poor. Literally, I I, I visited a couple classes, and what it is is okay, come in, sit down, here's the computer, do your credits. That was it. Sit down, watch these modules, get your credits. If you have a question, raise your hand, but don't really ask me because I'm not interested in helping you. Oh but sit here, <laughs> do the module, and get these credits. That's that's how it is. I've, I've, I've seen it. I've seen it with my own eyes, and it's, it's so infuriating because you're just like... Yeah. Oh, My experience in Salt River in trying to um, open um, our youth's eyes to American Indian history um, from um, not the viewpoint of the U.S. government so, um, is that they really have no idea. They have no idea why they're on a reservation. 
They have no idea why they have so many different social ills, why alcoholism is so bad. Um, it's just everyday life. So, you know, in some of the discussions I've had with them, um, and I've done with this with our teens group, is um, they were just clueless. But what's awesome about it, too, is trying to spark that interest to learn more. And, you know, I'm not to a point where I'm, you know, assigning homework by any means, but I'm asking them, you know, start asking your family questions because, you know, we go back to the whole boarding school and a lot of our elders now are victims of boarding school. So they don't openly share this information. A lot of it is tragic stories. Um, so that's like my challenge to young people, especially our young people, is ask your elders questions. You know what I mean? Start going and asking. You know what I mean? Because they need to, you know, put the light on for some of these families that we've lost this holistic view. We've lost this um, um, factor where, okay, if we have a family member who has, in, um, has a drug problem, you know, as a family, collectively, we need to address that issue versus, you know what I mean, just burning that bridge and letting that person go. It has yeah, to be something they want, though. Yeah. yeah. And it's no different than what you were talking about, pressure, parents pressuring their kids yeah. to do well in school. Yeah. So as a, as a Native American people, if you're going to pressure your children to adapt to their country, their, your, what was, you're, you're putting pressure. How do, you, how do you guide them to like it, to make it interesting and appealing? And, yeah. that's, and that's where that's I'm coming from. That's where I'm thinking you, it might start as a yeah. well, well, I'm I'm hoping. question if, if there are any sort of mentoring programs. Yes, sir. There, yeah. yes. there are a lot of mentoring programs on the reservation. And we're like reaching sure? one or two here and there, but it's Medicaid? just the, um, the rate is, is, is huge. Is the battle is huge. You have a little bit of mentors and yeah. a lot of people that need mentoring. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah it's, it's hard. What kind of counselors do they have in the school? Um, and that's another thing, is a lot of the counselors that work within the school, they are, they are white. And the kids already hold them in contempt. Mm -hmm. And so to try to go and Open express up. or even that. like like um, college counselors, career guidance counselors in the school. Do they have even when I moved to Texas and that was a questionable type of situation, they had um, they had a building that was dedicated because it was a very large school that was dedicated I mean, everybody in there who worked in that building were guidance counselors, and they had a sort of set of children or students that they contacted to see, okay, these are the classes you're taking, this is what you're working on to get, even my dad, he had horrible stories about being told to just become a mechanic and that sort of yeah. thing, oh, gosh. but, you know, mm -hmm. having guidance counselors in schools to guide them to achieve their goals, I mean, do they have that set mm -hmm. up to... They have you know, these are the steps you're going to have to take, these are the challenges you're going to face, this is how we're going to help you overcome these challenges. I think it's that same experience that you're talking about because I went to a border school. And what that means a border school is when I went to high school, we didn't have a high school on our reservation. So we had to, you know, drive or take the bus 30 miles out of town to uh, mainly, um, you know, a white, Hispanic community that um, for education, for high school. And that's what your guidance counselor is going to tell you, you know what I mean, is um, you can probably be this, you know what I mean? You can go work in the mines because I went to go to Miami school. So that's what, you know, they don't set the bar high. Do you know what I mean? It's just like trying to get you to pass. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So it's not a pressure of trying to be accelerated. Yeah. It's like pass. I feel like I was pretty fortunate because all of my counselors, I, I was not, there was not a very large native population of the school that I went to. I mean, I, I went to school in Utah and there are like no brown people in Utah. <laughs> like, I was like a speck of pepper <laughs> in a bag of salt. And so over there, because I performed well, I was like the prize native kid. And everybody was like, oh look, here's our little token brown girl. And she does. She does good in school. Here. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> like, so, Lata, to uh, go back to your original thesis about this, yes. the root cause you you uh, might identify yes. as the destruction of the family. Yeah. So, 
what could be done in terms of your own research? You know, what, I'm, pieces, yeah. what I'm hoping to do is first establish if there's a correlation between academic success and support system, strong support systems um, in Native American populations. And then upon that, I want to build a little more and then try to find and establish what constitutes a strong foundation within a Native American system. And then from there, try to establish, okay, what can we do to support those steps that constitute a strong foundation and how can we revitalize them so that we can start taking strides to moving past the past. The past. Okay. Personal opinion. I think that um, in this context that um, language is important, traditional mm -hmm. language, and um, that would set the foundation, like what, what we do in EP. Mm -hmm. I mean, how you have the culture embedded, how you go and, you know, the, the language, the songs, the dances, I think that is the key to helping our kids. And I think that starting with the little ones like EEP, you know what I mean, yes. is the key. Oh, I, I definitely, definitely agree with that. It's the only the only problem that I've seen with with teaching it and, and getting it in the schools is that you do teach it to them and then they go home. And then everything that you worked on all day long is lost. Yeah. Because they go home. Yeah. And when they're at home, they're not thinking about what I did at school that day. They're thinking about, oh my gosh, my uncle's gonna get drunk and he's gonna shank somebody in my house or yeah. something like along those lines. Or, oh my goodness, what am I going to eat? I have no food. How, how am I going to find food? Or, it's really cold and I need this. There are so many other factors outside of the school setting that are affecting the school setting that I want to see what we can do to, to help minimize those factors outside of the school setting so that way the things that we're doing in the school setting are effective. Yeah, are effective. That's, I, that's what, I don't know if that's even possible, if that's even realistic, but... It's something that I feel is worth exploring, Absolutely. especially with the dropout yeah. rates that we're experiencing right now amongst Native American populations in high school. And and I feel like it, the time is coming closer. Like we're getting we're getting closer where where we can talk about those things, because I know how you said ask questions to your elders, but some of the elders that they don't want to talk about yeah. it. You don't ask them. You just don't. And if you ask them those things. You expect to have a silent treatment for a really long time. <laughs> but it's time for that truth. Yeah. Really. And, it, and it's coming closer, right? Where it, it's starting to be okay to talk about it. Because when we talk about it, we're talking about the healing process. Yes. And not just as um, individuals, but as a community and as Native people. Mm -hmm. Because we're stuck in this, all these things. You know, it doesn't just happen here. It happens in all Native communities. But we need to begin that healing process. And where do we begin? It's with telling the truth. Yeah. Start speaking the truth about what happened. And that's like getting our elders to wake up as well. Yeah. So, I don't know. Are there any other questions? <laughs> Comments? Very interesting. Yeah. I'm thinking of even job fair, you know, like uh, invite a couple of people in different fields, you know, to come and talk about, or even they don't need to come, you know, ask the kids to do, that could be uh, a project, you know, so okay, why don't you think about five professions that you want to, that you are interested in, why don't you do research about what kind of education you need, mm -hmm. you know, see, you have to pass high school and go to college in yeah. order to become like this, you know, this is the highly paid position for you, and then um, that will motivate some kids, you know, so then remember, you told me that you wanted to become a lawyer or so and so and now you want to drop out you know so then talk to them that maybe instead of taking I mean, this class you can take this class outside and outside people yeah I mean, that's, that's hard that's hard, hard or easy that's to hard. do that's, no, that's hard it's that's so hard that almost goes against yeah. I mean, what is ex you can do to a point is it so being done too much to an extreme to not allow anybody in well there's to been to too many people that came yeah. in and did bad yeah but you're in control of so you go from one extreme, extreme. Yeah, it's you're on yeah. the two extremes. Yeah, exactly. It's never going to stabilize until you come down to the middle somewhere. And they're trying to get to the middle, but even still, a lot of the kids, a lot of my girls, I remember the first time, and I'm, I'm brown, and so it was a little bit easier for me to kind of break some of those barriers, but I remember we had this one coach that came in, and she was this white woman, and oh my gosh, they gave her 
hell for the whole season up until the very last two weeks of the season. And then they finally were like, okay, I guess she's cool. And then they let her in. The kids are sort of in the middle. Yeah. And you know, as a kid, when somebody says, don't cross this line, the first thing you want to do is put your toe out there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. oh, get across that line. <laughs> so it's like too much on one end is not good. It, it's just balance. It's, it's being yeah. so reactionary that you have people coming in to help. But it's like, if you have the knowledge, I know this has happened in the past, so if you mess with me or if you test me in the wrong way, I can call you on it and I can, you, you know, you're going to have to back off in these ways. But if you, you don't know your own history and you're just, anybody can show up and you just block them out. And it sounds like the community has no sort of personal sense or feeling of utility. You're, talk, you're right yes. though about the reactionary thing. Being reactionary is never good. You have yeah. to, it's a lot of work to get out of that. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and not only on top of that, like the, sort, the sense of being feeling worthwhile is... And then the, the problem you have is that you don't have a lot of people around, again, the, the mentoring, the role modeling, nobody modeling these behaviors that I can then model and your basis are people who've been torn apart and I don't want you to come into my community because you tore it apart but I'm learning unhealthy behaviors and um, I don't have an <coughs> interest or I feel like a vested interest in learning my own history which was a healthy history. Can I? Yes. Personal. You were the pepper and the salt. Yes. What did that feel like? Now what did it feel like? But look at you now. Uh, that didn't. Did that affect you badly? I mean, you no. you seem balanced. You see, you know, you, you're in touch. <laughs> you, you're in touch with your culture. You know, you were re you were obviously removed from all that for yes. a period of time. Um, and you're. I grew up. I grew up in Utah. So you were out of the. Yeah. You but I went home to my mother's reservation every summer. And it was brutal going to the reservation in the summer because I'm half. I mean, I'm half. I do not look native at all. I mean, what native has this kind of hair? <laughs> <laughs> and I'd be walking, and I would go to the boys and girls club on the on my on my reservation, and they would just be like, "What are you doing here? You're not native. You're not even full native. Get out of here." And I wasn't native enough for the natives, and then I wasn't Tongan enough for the Tongans. And I definitely wasn't white, so I was just in my own little, and that's where having a strong support system came into play, is my parents were, they didn't know everything, but they supported us, and we were pretty close-knit, as the definition was explained. <laughs> and I think that that was really the breaking point of whether or not I was going to succeed or not. So being yeah. half was your muddy path? Oh yes, being half was a muddy path for sure. Cause I got teased by everybody. <laughs> Being double was a muddy path. <laughs> Being double. Yeah. I don't like the word half. <laughs>